The Lord of the Rings, Part 2, by J.R.R. Tolkien. As they journeyed, the sun mounted and grew hot. Each time they climbed a ridge, the breeze seemed to have grown less. A shadow now lay round the edge of sight beyond which lay the country westward, a dark haze above which the upper sky was like a blue cap, hot and heavy. About midday, they came to a hill whose top was wide and flattened, like a shallow saucer with a green-mounded rim. Inside there was no air stirring. They rode across and looked northwards where they could glimpse a long, dark line. That's a line of trees, or so my excellent hobbit sight tells me. It must mark the road. Some say they were planted in the old days. Splendid. If we make as good going this afternoon as we have this morning, we shall have left the downs before the sun sets. Look at those stones up there. Like teeth they are, sticking out of green gums. Oh, don't look at them. Come down here. We can have lunch in this circle by this big stone here. Oh, yes, I'm hungry, aren't you? Mm. Come on, come on. Come on. Mm. Mr. Frodo, sir. Something's happened, sir. It's cold, for one thing. <coughs> oh, and something's happened to the sun. What, what is oh, it? Quick, get the ponies. The sun's setting and there's fog coming down. In fact, there's nothing but fog to be seen all around us. <coughs> Their going was very slow. They went in file to prevent their getting separated. Frodo led with Sam behind, then came Pippin, and then Merry. The valley seemed to stretch on endlessly once they had reached it. Then Frodo thought he saw a hopeful sign. Dark shapes began to loom up on either side through the mist. <coughs> Come on, follow me. This is the gap. At least, I think it's the gap in the hills. Instead, the dark patches grew darker, then shrank. And suddenly he saw, towering ominous before him, two huge standing stones. He passed between them, almost before he was aware, and even as he did so, darkness seemed to fall round him. Ah! Oh, crap, I've fallen off. Sam, Pip and Mary, why don't you keep up? Sam, Pip and Mary, Sam, Pip and Mary! Where are you? Where, where are you? Here, here. I am waiting for you. No! Ah! 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 A tall, dark shadow leaned over him. He thought he saw two eyes, very cold, though lit with a pale light which seemed to come from some remote distance. Then a grip, stronger and colder than iron, seized him. The icy touch froze his bones, and he remembered no more. Where am I? It must be inside a barrel. What's that green light round me? I can see the floor. <gasps> oh, no. There are Sam and Pippin and Mary laid out in white beside me. And treasures all piled round us. And they have circlets on their heads and gold chains about their waists. And rings on their fingers. And there are swords by their sides. And what's that? <gasps> A long... Single naked sword lies across their necks. No. What's that? <laughs> Round 
found a corner stretching into the place where they all lay, a long arm was groping, walking on its fingers toward Sam, who was lying nearest, and towards the hilt of the sword that lay upon him. I must put on the ring. Yes. No, no, I mustn't. I mustn't. Instead, I'll use this short sword. Kneeling, he stooped low over the bodies of his companions and with what strength he had, huge at the crawling arm. Uh, take that and that! <laughs> oh, now what shall I do? Oh, I wish Tom was... Tom! Yes, Tom! Oh, Tom Bombadil... Tom Bombadillo, <laughs> by water, wood, and hill, by reed and willow, come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. Vanish in the sunlight, shrivel like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing, leave your barrow empty till the world is mended. Oh, Tom, Tom. <laughs> Come, breath, Frodo, let's get out to the clean grass. You must help me bear them. Come. <laughs> Together they carried out Mary, Pippin, and Sam. As Frodo left the barrow, he thought he saw a severed hand wriggling still like a wounded spider in a heap of fallen earth. Tom came out with a great load of treasure, things of gold, silver, copper and bronze, and jeweled ornaments. Then he woke the hobbits with an incantation, and to Frodo's great joy the hobbits stirred, stretched their arms, and sprang up. They told of dreaming how they were fighting in ancient, long-forgotten battles and were killed and buried. And finally they took off their ancient clothes and circlets of gold and dressed themselves in spare clothes from their packs and Tom called up the ponies. Come, ponies, come, ponies. Uh, but there are six ponies now. Yes, that's old Fatty Lumpkin. He's my four-legged friend. Your ponies got to know him and ran to meet him in the night instead of getting lost like you. I'll have you safe over the borders of my land. I'll give you each a dagger from this hoard, forged many long years ago by the men of Westerness, foes of the Dark Lord. For out east, my knowledge fails. Tom is no master of riders from the Dark Land far beyond his country. Four miles along the road, you'll come upon a village, Bree, under Bree Hill. There you'll find an old inn called the Prancing Pony. The worthy keeper there's Barlam and Butterbur. There you can stay the night. There now, farewell, the hobbits. Farewell, the hobbits. Hey, where are you, you woolly footed slow coach? Nob! Coming, sir, coming. Uh, tell Bob there's five ponies that have to be stabled. He must find room somehow. I'll find you, sir. Now, who did you say you are? Uh, Mr. Took. Took? Uh, and Mr. Brandybuck. Brandybuck. And this is Sam Gamgee. Gamgee. And uh, my name is Underhill. Underhill. There now. There's that party that came up from Greenway from down south last night. That was strange enough to begin with. And I thought I had something to remember. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's gone again. But it'll come back when I have time to think. This way now. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you would care to join the company for supper. The company would be very pleased to welcome you. We don't get outsiders. Um, travelers from the Shire are begging your pardon very often. It'll be too stuffy in there for me. You others go. And you'll come in here and sit down and make yourself comfortable. And these are our local Bree folk. Rushlight, coat leaf, heather toes, Appledore Thistlewood, a ferny too over there. <laughs> and some of your own folk. 
the Mugwort family here, and Mr. Banks, Mr. Brockhouse, and Mr. Longholes, and there's Mr. Sandheaver and young Tunnelly, and some of your own family, to be sure, the Underhill from Staddle. Here's another Mr. Underhill. <laughs> <laughs> what brings this Underhill here, sir? Oh, oh, uh, what brings you here? I, I'm interested in uh, history uh, and uh, 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 geography. Ah, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> isn't that nice? Uh, and 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 I'm writing a book. Yeah, uh, a book, a book. Yes, yes. Um, uh, we'd like to collect information about uh, hobbits uh, living outside the Shire. Uh, especially in these, uh, the, uh, the eastern land. Yes. Well, there's plenty of us there. Oh, well, I mean, I can tell you some folks as would know. How about the stockhouses? They might yeah. know something. Well, yeah, yeah, but what do you do your, yourself, right. Mr. Underhill? Yeah. Do. After a time, as Frodo didn't prove very communicative, he soon found himself sitting alone in a corner, listening and looking around. The men in the room and the dwarves were mostly talking of distant events and telling news of a kind that was becoming only too familiar. There was trouble away in the south. The men from Greenway were already on the move, looking for lands where they could find some peace. The local inhabitants were sympathetic, but not very ready for large numbers of strangers arriving in their little land. Suddenly Frodo noticed a strange-looking, weather-beaten man sitting in the shadows near the wall, listening intently to the talk. Under his hood he showed a shaggy head of dark hair flecked with gray, and in a pale, stern face a pair of keen gray eyes. Um, Mr. Butterbur, Mr. Butterbur, uh, who is that man? Oh, uh, him? I don't rightly know. He's one of the wandering folk. Rangers, we call him. He seldom talks. He disappears for a month or a year, and then he pops up again. Mm. He's known around here as Strider. Goes about at a great rate. Oh, there now. He's waving you over to him. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Um, Underhill. If old Butterbur got your name right. Uh, he did. Well, Master Underhill... If I were you, I should stop your young friends from talking too much. This isn't the Shire. There are strange folk about, and there have been even stranger travelers through Bree lately. Listen, there's one of you now. Then Bilbo gave his final birthday party. It was a great success. I leave you now, he says. You better do something quick. Oh, uh, I have something to tell. <clears throat> and I have a song to sing. Uh, um... Oh, why don't I put on the ring? No, I must certainly stop it from getting lost, though. Frodo stepped nervously upon a small table near the main company of guests. His hand was in his pocket, and he held the ring. Suddenly, his foot slipped. He rolled off the table with a crash, a clatter, and a bump, and the ring slipped on his finger. He crawled under the tables to the dark corner by Strider and took off the ring. Where's he got to? He's vanished. Did you see that? Slop through the floor without leaving a hole. Here. I don't like this at all, I don't. Boy, what's uh, going uh, on you here? Get away from Boy. those newcomers. Vanished into the air, he did. I saw what I saw, and then I saw what I didn't. Well, you put your foot in it, or should I say your finger? I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. But we'd better wait until the uproar has died down. Then, if you please, Mr. Baggins... I should like a quiet word with you. What about? A matter of some importance to us both. Frodo, Pippin, and Sam made their way back to the parlor. Mary wasn't there, and not until they'd puffed up the embers of the fire into a blaze did they discover that Strider had come with them and was calmly sitting in a chair by the door. Hello. Who are you? I am called Strider. Your friend promised to have a quiet talk with me, but of course I have my price. What do you Don't mean? Don't be alarmed. I mean just this. I will give you some good advice, but I shall want a reward. And what will that be, pray? Well, no more than you can afford. Just this. 
You must take me along with you until I wish to leave you. Oh, indeed. I'd need to know a good deal more about you and your business. Excellent. You seem to be more sensible now. You've been much too careless so far. I'll tell you what I know and leave the reward to you. I'm looking for a hobbit called Frodo Baggins. I had learned that he was carrying out of the Shire, well, a secret that concerned me and my friends. What do you say? Oh, look out, Mr. Under, uh, Underhill, sir. Now, I shall take more care of the secret than you do, and care is needed. Watch every shadow. Dark horsemen have passed through Bree. On Monday, one came down the Greenway, they say, and another appeared later, coming up the Greenway from the south. And the landlord seems to have heard something, too. Why on earth did we behave so foolishly? I would have stopped you going into the common room, but the innkeeper wouldn't let me in to see you. Do you think he... No, I don't think any harm of old Butterbur. He doesn't like my sort. After all, I do have a rascally look about me, haven't I? I hope we shall get to know one another better. When we do, I hope you will explain your little prank... It was sheer accident. I wonder. Accident or no, it has made your position dangerous. The horseman will return. I know these riders. A horseman will watch the open road night and day. You may escape from Bree, but you won't go far. They'll come on you in the wild in some dark place where there is no help. Do you wish them to find you? They are terrible. Terrible. He looks like he's in pain. Look at his hands, all clenched. There now. You don't yet fear your pursuers enough. Tomorrow you will have to escape, if you can. And Strider can take you by paths that are seldom trodden. Will you have him? By your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. This Strider here comes out of the wild, and that's no reason to let him lead us into some dark place, far from help, as he puts it. Well, I need to know more of your story. And why the disguise? Who are you? Your voice has changed. And how do you know about my... my business? To trust me is now your only chance to get to Rivendell. And my story... I beg pardon, sir. I've come to bid you good night. Um, sir, I'm a busy man, and I was asked to look out for a hobbit name of Baggins in particular, and going by the name of Underhill... And that seems to fit you well enough, if I may say so. He even described you, sir, did Gandalf. Gandalf? Yes, sir. Now, where was I one thing and another? Um, oh, yes. I have a letter I was to have sent, but I put it by safe. And then I couldn't find nobody willing to go to the Shire, and then there was these dark men looking for Baggins and that ranger Strider asking questions, too. He came to offer me his help. If I was in your plight, I wouldn't take up with a ranger. Well, then who would you take up with, Butterbur? Hmm? A fat innkeeper who only remembers his own name because people shouted at him all day. Strider, will you go with him? Me? Leave Bray. I wouldn't do it for any money. Anyway, what are these horsemen after? I'm not sure, but I fear they come from... They come from Mordor. Oh. From Mordor, Barlaman, if that means anything to you. Oh, save us. That's the worst news that has come to me in my time. I must go and bar the doors quick. You do want looking after and no mistake. Good night. Spooks or no spooks, they won't get in the pony so easy. Don't you worry till the morning. Good night, Mr. Baggins. <clears throat> Mr. Underhill, I should say. Well, are you going to open that letter? The seal's intact, at least, and it's Gandalf's own. He wrote it here at the pony. Hmm. Dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go off at once. Leave Bag End soon, before the end of July. July? You can trust the landlord and may meet a friend of mine on the road called by some strider. Hmm. Make for Rivendell, where if I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. P.S. Do not use it again. Not for any reason, whatever. Do not travel by night. P.P.S. Make sure it is the real strider. There are many strange men on the roads. Then there's a verse. Oh. What is your name, your true name, Strider? I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn. 
And if by life or death I can save you, I will. My broken sword will be forged anew, as your verses say, I think. So, that is settled then. Tomorrow we shall make for Weathertop, a hill halfway from here to Rivendell. Still, only the enemy would have hindered Gandalf, and I'm troubled for the first time since I've known him. But don't give up hope. This business of ours will be his greatest task, and he is greater than you Shire folk know. It's Mr. Merry, sir. It must be. Oh, I've seen them. Frodo, I've seen them. Black Riders. Black Riders? Where? Oh, here in Bree. Oh, I no. sat here for a bit, then went out. I felt something near me, then it slid away, and I followed it. It seemed to draw me. You have a stout heart, but it was foolish. Who would... This is a friend of Gandalf's. I'll explain later. No, oh, the help found me. It was as if I'd had an ugly dream. I don't know what came over me. I do. Their breath. Now they will all know the news. You must all stay here and not go to your rooms tonight. Nob can put bolsters in your beds and mats for your hair. I'll build up the fire and blow out the candles. And you must sleep. As they prepared for sleep in the inn at Bree, darkness lay on Buckland. A mist strayed in the dells and along the river bank. The house at Crick Hollow, which Frodo and his companions had left now so many days ago, stood silent. Fatty Bolger opened the door cautiously and peered out. As he stared out into the gloom, a black shadow moved under the trees. Terror seized him. He shrank back. Then he shut and locked the door. Fatty Bulger had not been idle. As soon as he saw the dark shapes creep from the garden, he knew that he must run for it or perish. He was found at the nearest house crying and babbling. Oh, no, 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 not me. I haven't got it. I haven't got it. <laughs> so the brandy bucks blew the horn call of Buckland that had not been sounded for a hundred years. The dark shapes fled from the house. They rode like a gale to the north gate. Let the little people blow. Sauron would deal with them later. Meanwhile, they had another errand. They knew now for certain that the house was empty and the ring had gone. They rode down the guards at the gate and vanished from the shire. In the early night, Frodo awoke to find Strider sitting alert in his chair, his eyes gleaming in the light of the fire. He soon went to sleep again, but his dreams were disturbed with the noise of wind and galloping hoofs. In the morning, Strider roused them all and led the way to their bedrooms. The windows had been forced open, the beds tossed about, and the bolsters slashed and flung upon the floor. The mats were torn to pieces. And every horse and beast in the stable, gone. Never has such a thing happened in my time. What are we coming to? Dark times. We will leave at once. We shall be packed in a few minutes. Ponies won't help us escape horsemen. How much are you prepared to carry on your backs? Oh, as, as much as we must. All right. I can carry enough for two. Oh. Finally, they purchased a half-starved pony from Bill Fernie, loaded it up with as much of their baggage as they had a heart to give it, and at last left the village behind. On the third day, they came out of a wood and entered a wide, flat expanse of country, much more difficult to manage. The ground now became damp and the flies began to torment them. The air was full of tiny midges that crept up their sleeves and breeches and into their hair. I'm being eaten alive. 
You call this place Midgewater? There are more midges than water. Oh, Mr. Frodo, what do they live on when they can't get hobbits? Ooh, take that! Ooh, snap that! The next day, the fourth, was a little better. And on the fifth, they left the last straggling pool and reed bed behind them. The land before them began steadily to rise again. The highest of the hills in the distance was a little separated from the others. It had a conical top, slightly flattened at the summit. That's weathered up. The old road which we have left far away passes not far from its foot. It's not certain what we shall find there. It's close to the road. But surely you were hoping to find Gandalf there. Yes, but the hope is faint. Unless by luck we arrive almost together. If the riders fail to find us in the wilderness, they're likely to make for Weathertop. Already the hobbits were getting used to much walking on short rations. Shorter at any rate than what in the Shire they would have thought barely enough to keep them on their legs. Oh. You know, Frodo, you're looking twice the hobbit that you're used to. <laughs> Very odd, considering <laughs> there is actually a good deal less of me. I hope <laughs> the thinning true. process won't go on indefinitely, or I shall become a wraith. <laughs> Don't speak of such things. I wonder who made this path and those stones. I'm not sure I like it. It has a barrow whitish look. No, there is no barrow on Weathertop, nor on any of these hills. The men of the West did not live here. In the days of the North Kingdom, they built a great watchtower on Weathertop. Amon Sul, they called it. It was burned and broken, and nothing remains of it now but a tumbled ring, like a rough crown on the old hill's head. It is told that Elendil stood there, watching for the coming of Gilgalad out of the West in the days of the last alliance. Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free, between the mountains and the sea. I learned that from Mr. Bilbo when I was a lad. There's a lot more all about Mordor. I, I didn't learn that part. Ugh, it gave me the shivers. I never thought I should be going that way myself. Going to Mordor? I hope it won't come to that. Don't speak that name so loudly. On the western flank of Weathertop, they found a sheltered hollow at the bottom of which there was a bowl-shaped dell with grassy sides. There they left Sam with the pony and their packs and luggage. On the top they found a cairn of broken stones had been piled. They were blackened as with fire. About them the turf was burned to the roots, and all within the ring, the grass was scorched and shriveled as if flames had swept the hilltop. But there was no sign of any living thing. Oh, well, here we are. And very cheerless and uninviting it looks. And no sign of Gandalf. I wonder. Even if he was a day or two behind us, he could have arrived here first. Here, look at this stone. It's flatter than the others, and whiter as if it escaped the fire. Oh, there's some scratches on it. There seems to be a, a stroke, a dot, and three more strokes. It could be a rune, a G rune. The scratches are fine and certainly fresh, but the marks might mean something. I should say they stand for G3 and were a sign that Gandalf was here on October the 3rd, three days ago now. It would also show that he was in a hurry and danger was at hand so that he had no time or did not dare to write longer. I guess that he was attacked on this hilltop, but with what result I can't tell. He's here no longer and we must now look after ourselves and make our own way to Rivendell as best we can. It will take us a fortnight and we won't be able to use the road. Look, look down the road there. See those two black specks going westward? And see there are three others creeping eastward to meet them. Down. What is it? I don't know. Let me look again. Yes, the enemy is here, assembling on the road beyond the foot of the hill. We found some firewood. I wonder if old Gandalf put it here. But hadn't we better clear out quick, Mr. Strider? This hole makes my heart sink somehow. The road is watched, and the land beyond the hills is bare and flat for miles. Those horses can see. 
and their riders use men and other creatures as spies. They smell the blood of living things, desiring it and hating it. Also, the ring draws them. Fire is our only friend in the wilderness. These riders do not love it. Maybe. It's also as good a way of saying, here we are, as I can think of except shouting it. The cold increased as darkness came on. Peering out from the edge of the dell, they could see nothing but a gray land vanishing quickly into shadow. Frodo and his companions huddled round the fire, but Strider was content with a single cloak and sat a little apart, drawing thoughtfully on his pipe. He chanted a love ballad of the meeting of Tinuviel and Beren as the moon began to rise. Sam and Mary got up and walked away from the fire. All seemed quiet, except that Frodo felt a cold dread creeping over his heart. I don't know what it is, but I suddenly felt afraid. I felt that something was creeping up the slope. Keep close to the fire. Hush! What's that? What are those dark shapes? Oh. oh! I must put on the ring. I must put it on. I must put on the ring. I must put on the ring. I must put on the ring. The ring slipped on Frodo's finger and immediately the shapes became terribly clear. There were five tall figures. In their white faces burned keen and merciless eyes. Under the mantles were long gray robes. Upon their gray hairs were helms of silver. In their haggard hands were swords of steel. Their eyes fell upon him and pierced him as they rushed towards him. Desperate, he drew his own sword and it flickered red as if it was a firebrand. One of the figures, taller than the others, his hair long and gleaming and on his helm a crown. In one hand he held a long sword and in the other a knife. Both the knife and the hand that held it glowed with a pale light. He sprang forward and bore down on Frodo. Oh, Elbereth! Gilthoniel! <laughs> My shoulder! <laughs> away, 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 away! Even as Strider leaped out of the darkness with a flaming brand in either hand, Frodo, with a last effort, dropping his sword, slipped the ring from his finger and closed his right hand tight upon it. When Frodo came to himself, he was lying by the fire which was now piled high and burning brightly. His three companions were bending over him. Uh, uh, what, what's happened? Uh, where is the Pale King? What do you mean, Master? Oh. We saw nothing but some vague shadow shapes coming toward us. Then you vanished and a black shadow rushed past me. I heard your voice, Master but it seemed to come from a great distance, or from under the earth, crying out strange words. Strider found you lying face down with your sword beneath you. That was a good while ago, and Strider's disappeared. I still have my doubts about him. Sam! There he is now. Sam, I'm not a black rider, nor in league with them. I've been trying to discover something of their movements, but I've found nothing. There's no feeling of their presence anywhere at hand. I cannot think why they don't attack again. Now, heat as much water as you can in those small kettles of yours and bathe his wounds with it. Keep the fire going well and keep Frodo warm. Sam, come over here. There seem only to have been five of the enemy. Why they weren't all here, I don't know, but I don't think they expected to be resisted. They'll come again another night. I fear, Sam, that they believe your master has a deadly wound that will subdue him to their will. Oh, oh now, no! Now, don't despair. You must trust me now. Your Frodo is made of sterner stuff than I had guessed, though Gandalf hinted that it might prove so. He's not slain, 
and I think he'll resist the evil power of the wound longer than his enemies will expect. I will do all I can to help and heal him, guard him well while I'm away. Frodo dozed. Though the pain of his wound was slowly growing, and a deadly chill was spreading from his shoulder to his arm and side. His friends watched over him and the night passed slowly and wearily. Dawn was growing in the sky when Strider at last returned. Look, a black cloak with a slash a foot above the hem. The enemy is unharmed, I fear, but all blades perish that pierced that dreadful king. More deadly to this evil king was the name El Berith, and more deadly to Frodo was this. See how this knife is notched, its point broken off, yet watch how it melts in the growing light. It's so strange. Alas, it was this accursed knife which gave the wound. Few now have the skill in healing to match such evil weapons, but I will do what I can with these leaves. I found this plant in the dark by its scent. I'll bathe the shoulder with the brew of it. See, here. Oh, the pain lessens, but I, I, oh, I still can't raise my hand, and I feel too weak to stand. As soon as the daylight was full, they had some hurried food and packed. It was impossible for Frodo to walk, so they divided the luggage among the four of them and put Frodo on the pony. The wind began to blow steadily out of the west and pour water on the dark head of the hills in fine drenching rain. They were nearly ten days out from Weathertop and their stock of provisions was beginning to run low. It went on raining. We can't go any further. I'm afraid this has been too much for Frodo. Look at him. He's shivering. His left arm is lifeless. Do you think we'll be able to cure him in Rivendell? Oh, if we ever get there. What is the matter with my master? His wound is already closed. There's nothing but a white mark on his shoulder. Frodo has been touched by the weapons of the enemy, and there's some poison or evil at work beyond my skill to drive out. But don't give up hope, Sam. We must make for the road again. We cannot hope to find a path through these hills. Whatever danger may be set it, the road is our only way to the ford. There's a path here. Yes, though it was made by strong arms and heavy feet. Come on. Oh. Oh. There's a door in the side <coughs> of that cliff. This is a troll hole, if ever there was one. Come on, let's get away. Now we know who made the path. Well, there's no need, I think. Let's continue down and see. There are trolls. You can see them down there through the tree trunks. We'll, we'll go and look at them. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, my feet. Well, here are your trolls. Come on, get up, old stone. We're forgetting our family history. These must be the very three trolls that were caught by Gandalf, quarreling over the right way to cook 13 dwarves and one hobbit. <laughs> I had no idea we were anywhere near the place. Oh, we know Bilbo's story well. Yeah, you're forgetting not only your family history, but all you ever knew about trolls. It's broad daylight with a bright sun today, and yet you try to scare me with a tale of live trolls waiting for us in the glade. <laughs> in any case, you might have noticed that one of them has an old bird's nest behind his ear. That would be a most uh, unusual ornament for a live troll. In the afternoon, they went on down the woods, probably following the very track that Gandalf, Bilbo, and the dwarves had used many years before. In the early evening, the road lay quiet under long shadows, and they were beginning to look out for a place off the road where they could camp for the night when they heard a sound which brought fear to their hearts. Well, that doesn't sound to me like a black rider's horse. You never know, though. Oh, you don't. Hush! While I listen to the ground. Why, I do believe... Hello there! Hello there! Suddenly into view came a white horse, gleaming in the shadows, running swiftly. 
In the dusk, its head stall flickered and flashed as if it were studded with gems like living stars. The rider's cloak streamed behind him and his hood was thrown back. His golden hair flowed shimmering in the wind of his speed. To Frodo, it appeared that a white light was shining through the form and raiment of the rider as if through a thin veil. This is Glorfindel, who dwells in the house of Elrond. Hail and well met at last, Aragorn. I was sent from Rivendell to look for you and the hobbits. We feared that you were in danger upon the road. Then Gandalf has reached Rivendell? No, he hadn't when I departed. But that was nine days ago. Elrond received news that troubled him. Some of my kindred traveling in your land learned that things were amiss and sent messages as swiftly as they could. They said that the nine were abroad and that you were astray bearing a great burden without guidance, for Gandalf had not returned. I left a token on the road at the last bridge. Three of the servants of Sauron were on the bridge, and I pursued them westward. But come, there is no time for further news. We must risk the peril of the road and go. There are five behind us, and when they find your trail upon the road, they will ride like the wind. I fear we may find the ford is already held against us. Come! My master is sick and wounded. He can't go on riding after nightfall. He needs rest. Oh, let me look. We were attacked at our camp on Weathertop. Here is the hilt, at least, of the knife which wounded him. Mm. There are evil things written on this hilt, though maybe your eyes cannot see them. Keep it, Aragorn, till we reach the house of Elrond. But be wary and handle it as little as you may. Alas, the wounds of this weapon are beyond my skill to heal. I will do what I can, but all the more do I urge you now to go on without rest. Let me see. Oh, oh, that feels less chill. The pain is easier. I see you all more clearly than before. Uh, yet I fear this wound. Come, you shall ride my horse. I shan't ride him if I am to be carried off to Rivendell or anywhere else, leaving my friends behind in danger. I doubt very much if your friends would be in danger if you were not with them. The pursuit would follow you and leave us in peace. It is you, Frodo, and that which you bear that brings us all in peril. Well then, I will mount if I can. Glorfindel only allowed two brief halts during the day's march, and Frodo's pain had redoubled. During the day, things about him faded to shadows of ghostly gray so that he almost welcomed the coming of night. <sighs> Our peril will be greatest just ere we reach the river, for my heart warns me that the pursuit is now swift behind us, and other danger may be waiting by the ford. Faster now. Faster. The road was still running swiftly downhill. Then at the bottom of a sharp incline, they saw before them a long, flat mile, and beyond that, the ford of Rivendell. On the other side of the river was a steep brown bank, threaded by a winding path, and behind that, the tall mountains climbed shoulder above shoulder and peak beyond peak into the fading sky. Wait. Listen. Oh. White horse leaped forward. The hobbits ran down the slope. Glorfindel and Strider followed as rear guard. They were only halfway across the flat when suddenly there was a noise of horses galloping. Out of the hole in the trees they had just left rode a rider. He reined his horse in and halted, swaying in his saddle. Another followed him, and then another, and then again two more. Ride forward, Frodo! Ride! I... I can't seem to... I can't seem to... Ride! Ride on, Frodo! Not a limb, my horse! Not a limb, as Ride! At the same moment as the white horse sprang away and sped along the last lap of the road with Frodo clutching his mane, the riders leaped down the hill in pursuit. To Frodo's dismay, no sooner had the riders left the trees behind him than four more suddenly appeared. Two rode towards him and two galloped madly towards the ford to cut off his escape. Frodo looked back for a moment over his shoulder. He could no longer see his friends. 
The riders behind were falling back. He looked forward and hope faded. There seemed no chance of reaching the ford before he was cut off by the others. They had cast aside their hoods and cloaks and were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands. Helms were on their heads. Their cold eyes glittered and they called to him with fell voices. A breath of deadly cold pierced Frodo like a spear as with a last spurt like a flash of fire the elf horse speeding as if on wings passed right before the face of the foremost rider and into the ford. He was across the ford but the pursuers were close behind. At the top of the bank the horse halted back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more. the fair. You shall have neither the ring nor me. Oh. Ah! Ah! <laughs> With his last failing senses, Frodo heard cries, and it seemed to him that he saw, beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore, a shining figure of white light and behind it ran small, shadowy forms of waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. The black horses were filled with madness, and leaping forward in terror, they bore their riders into the rushing flood. Their piercing cries were drowned in the sudden onset of the roaring river as it carried them away. And Frodo felt himself falling and the roaring and confusion seemed to rise and engulf him together with his enemies. He heard and saw no more. Frodo woke and found himself lying in bed. At first he thought he had slept late after a long, unpleasant dream that still hovered on the edge of memory. Or perhaps he had been ill. But the ceiling looked strange. It was flat and it had dark beams richly carved. <sighs> oh, where am I? Oh, and what's the time? In the house of Elrond, <gasps> it's ten o'clock in the morning, Frodo. It's the morning of October the 24th, if you want to know. Gandalf? Yes. It's you there by the window. Yes, I'm here. Oh. And you're lucky to be here, too, after all the absurd things you've done since you left home. Oh, well, I'm too comfortable to argue. You mean about my little accident at the Prancing Pony? Huh? Where's Sam? And are the others all right? Yes, yes, they're all safe and sound. Sam was here until I sent him off to get some rest about half an hour ago. What happened at the ford? It all seems so dim somehow. Yes, it would. You were beginning to fade. The Morgul Lord and his riders have come forth. War is preparing. Oh, then you knew of the riders already, before I met them. Yes, I spoke of them once too, you remember. The riders are the ringwraiths. The ringwraiths? The nine servants of the Lord of the Rings. But I didn't know that they had arisen again, or I should have fled with you at once. But anyhow, for the moment at least, we've been saved from disaster by Aragorn, son of Arathorn, of the race of the kings. Is Strider one of the old kings? Why, well, I thought they had all vanished. I thought he was only a ranger. Only a ranger? My dear Frodo, that's just what the rangers are. The last remnant of the great people, the men of the West. I shall need their help in the days to come, for we have reached Rivendell, but the ring isn't yet at rest. I suppose not. No. 
But I hope I won't have to go any further. It's very pleasant just to rest. I've had a month of exile and adventure, and I find that has been as much as I want. And I can move my arm a little, too. Good, good. It's mending fast. Elrond has cured you. He's tended you for days, ever since you were brought in. Gandalf, tell me the end of the affair at the ford. Then I shall have another sleep. The ring wraiths made straight for you. The moment the flood appeared, Glorfindel rushed out, and you saw him for a moment as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. Three riders were carried away by the first assault of the flood, and the others were hurled into the water by their horses and overwhelmed. And is that the end of the ring race? No, no, their horses must have perished, and without them they're crippled, but not so easily destroyed. As soon as the captain of the ring wraiths rode into the water, Elrond commanded the flood to be released. He has power over the river in this valley. And if I may say so, I added a few touches of my own. Uh, you oh. may not have noticed, but <laughs> some of the waves took the form of great white horses with shining white riders, and, and there were many rolling and grinding boulders. <laughs> uh, perhaps too many. Uh, maybe? Well... Anyway, now we are safe. Uh, yes, 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 you're safe for the present. Soon there'll be feasting and merrymaking to celebrate the victory, and then the council. It's wonderful that Elrond and Glorfindel and such great lords, not to mention Strider, should take so much trouble over me. There are many reasons why they should. I have one good reason. The ring is another. Yes. You are the ring-bearer, and you are the heir of Bilbo, the ring-finder. Dear Bilbo, I wonder where he is. Oh, I wish he were here and could hear all about it. It would have made him laugh. <laughs> and the poor old troll. Oh, yes. <laughs> the troll. <laughs> The hall of Elrond's house was filled with folk. Elves for the most part, though there were a few guests of other sorts. Elrond sat in a great chair at the end of the long table upon the dais. And next to him on the one side sat Glorfindel, on the other Gandalf. Frodo looked at them in wonder. Glorfindel was tall and straight. His hair was of shining gold, his face fair and young and fearless and full of joy. On his brow sat wisdom, and in his hand was strength. Elrond was ageless, neither old nor young. His hair was dark as the shadows of twilight, and upon it was set a circlet of silver. Venerable he seemed as a king crowned with many winters, and yet hale as a tried warrior in the fullness of his strength. Next to Frodo on his right sat a dwarf of important appearance, richly dressed. His beard, very long and forked, was white. Welcome and well met. Glow in at your service. Frodo Baggins at your service and your family's. Uh, am I right in guessing that you are the Glowin? Uh, <laughs> one of the twelve companions of the great Thorin Oakenshield? Quite right. And allow me to congratulate you on your recovery. I wonder greatly what brings four hobbits on so long a journey. I am equally curious to learn what brings so important a dwarf so far from the Lonely Mountain. If you have not heard, I think we won't speak yet of that either. Master Elrond will summon us all ere long, I believe, and then we shall hear many things. Mm. At length the feast came to an end. Elrond and Arwen rose and went down the hall, and the company followed them in due order. They came into a further hall. As Elrond entered and went toward the seat prepared for him, elvish minstrels began to make sweet music. Slowly the hall filled, and Frodo looked with delight upon the many fair faces that were gathered together. Suddenly he noticed not far from the further end of the fire a small dark figure seated on a stool with his back propped against a pillar. Beside him on the ground was a drinking cup and some bread. 
His head seemed sunk in sleep on his breast, and a fold of his dark cloak was drawn over his face. Elrond went forward and stood beside the silent figure. Awake, little master. Frodo! Yes, Master Elrond? Now at last the hour has come that you have wished for, Frodo. Here is a friend that you have long missed. What's that? Bilbo! Oh, Bilbo! Oh, how good to see you, Bilbo! Hello, Frodo, <laughs> my lad! Oh. So you've got here at last. Well, yes. I hoped you'd manage it. <laughs> well, well, so all this feasting is in your honor, I oh, hear. well. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Well, why weren't you there? And why haven't I been allowed to see you before? Because you were asleep. I've sat by your side with Sam each day. But as for the feast, I don't go in for such things much now. And I had something else to do. I sit and think and make up songs. Time doesn't seem to pass here. It just is. A remarkable place altogether. And fancy that ring of mine causing such a disturbance. It's a pity Gandalf didn't find out more sooner. I could have brought the thing here myself long ago without so much trouble. But they wouldn't let me go back and get it. They seemed to think the enemy was looking high and low for me and would make mincemeat of me if he caught me tottering about in the wild. <laughs> Gandalf said, the ring has passed on, Bilbo. Don't meddle with it again. Odd sort of remark, just like Gandalf. Have you got it here? I should like very much to peep at it again. Yes, I've got it. It looks the same as it always did. Here, if you must. But no, why should I? I I'm sorry, put it away. Don't adventures ever have an end? Bilbo! Ah, there you are, Dunedin. Strider, you seem to have a lot of names. Why do you call him Dunedin? The Dunedin, man of the West. Where have you been, my friend? I want your help. Elrond says this song of mine is to be finished before the end of the evening, and I'm stuck. Oh. <laughs> Let's go into the corner and polish it up. <laughs> Come then, let me hear it. It goes something like this. Urendel was a mariner. Next day, Frodo woke early, feeling refreshed and well. He watched the cool sun rise above the far mountains and shine down, slanting through the thin silver mist. The dew upon the yellow leaves was glimmering, and the woven nets of gossamer twinkled on every bush. Sam walked beside him, saying nothing, but sniffing the air and looking every now and again with wonder in his eyes at the great heights in the east. The snow was white upon their peaks. On a seat cut in the stone beside a turn in the path, they came upon Gandalf and Bilbo deep in talk. Hello, good morning. Feel ready for the great council? And that's the warning bell for it. Come along now. Both you, Frodo, and Bilbo here are wanted over in the hall where we were last night. Here, my friends, is the hobbit Frodo, son of Drogo. Few have ever come hither through greater peril or on an errand more urgent. This is Glowen and Glowen's son, Gimli. Glorfindel, you know. Arestor and Kaldor from the Grey Havens. This is Legolas, a messenger from his father, the King of the Elves of Northern Mirkwood. And here is Boromir, a man from the south. He arrived in the Grey of the Morning and seeks counsel. I have bidden him be present, for here his questions will be answered. Now, to begin, I shall summarize for you. Not all that was spoken and debated in the council need now be told. 
Much was said of events in the world outside, especially in the south. Then Glowin told of the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain. Thirty years have passed since Balin went with Ori and Owen to open the mines of Moria. We have heard no word since. But then, about a year ago, a messenger came to Dane. But not from Moria. From Mordor. A horseman in the night. The Lord Sauron the Great, so he said, wished for our friendship rings he would give for it, such as he gave of old. And he asked urgently concerning hobbits, of what kind they were and where they dwelt. For Sauron knows, said he, that one of these was known to you on a time. At this we were greatly troubled. Then he lowered his fell voice to add that as a small token only of our friendship, Sauron asked that we should find this thief, such was his word, and get from him, willing or no, a little ring, the least of rings that once he stole. Then the realm of Moria shall be ours forever. At twice now, the messenger has returned for our answer. And the last time, so he says, is soon to come. So I have been sent at last by Dane to warn Bilbo that he is sought by the enemy. If we make no answer, the enemy may move men to assail us. No, something oh, you have done. done well to come, Glowin. But you do not stand alone. Your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world. And now the ruling ring. The one has been found again, though lost for so long. And the Tower of Sorcery has become a place of dread. What can we do? My Lord Boromir, you have leave to speak. Master Elrond, believe not that in the land of Gondor the blood of Numenor is spent, nor all its pride and dignity forgotten. By our valor, the terror of Morgul is kept at bay, but the nameless enemy has risen again. Oh. As smoke rises once more from Orodruin, that we call Mount Doom, mm. the power of the Dark Land grows, and we are hard beset. And this very year, sudden war came upon us out of Mordor, and we were swept away. Mordor has allied itself with the Easterlings and the cruel Haradrim. I don't seek allies in war. The might of Elrond is in wisdom, it is said. A dream my brother had, and once did I. From it a voice cried, seek for the sword that was broken. In Imladris it dwells. A token that doom is near at hand, for Isildur's bane shall waken, and the halfling forth shall stand. Our father, Denethor, lord of Minas Tirith, said only that Imladris was of old the name where Elrond dwelt, whose house I have sought for so long. And here in the house of Elrond, more shall be made clear to you, Lord Boromir. Here is the sword that was broken. Oh, and who are you, and what have you to do with Minas Tirith? He is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, descended through many fathers from Isildur, Elendil, son of Minas Ithil. He is the chief of the Denedain in the north, and few are now left of that folk. Then it belongs to you and not to me at all. It does not belong to either of us, but it has been ordained that you should hold it for a while. Bring out the ring, Frodo. The time has come. Hold it up, and then Boromir will understand the remainder of his riddle. Oh. Behold! Isildur's bane! Ah, oh, yes, and the halfling. <laughs> Is then the doom of Minas Tirith come at last? But why should we seek a broken sword? Doom and great deeds are indeed at hand. For the sword that was broken is the sword of Elendil. It has been treasured by his heirs, for it was spoken of old among us that it should be made again when the ring Isildur's bane was found. A new hour comes. 
Battle is at hand. The sword shall be reforged. I will come to Minas Tirith. So you say. I have seen a bright ring in the halfling's hand. How do the wise know this ring is Isildur's? These things, it is the part of Gandalf to make clear, and I call upon him last, for it is the place of honor, and in all this matter, he has been the chief. Well, some would think the tidings of Glowin and the pursuit of Frodo proof enough that the halfling's trove is a thing of great worth to the enemy. Yet it is a ring. What then? The nine, the Nazgul ringwraiths keep. The seven are taken or destroyed. The three we know of. What then is this one that he desires so much? Some here will remember that many years ago, I myself dared to pass the doors of the necromancer and found thus that our fears were true. He was none other than Sauron, our enemy of old, at length taking shape and power again. We also learned that as his power grew, he was seeking ever more eagerly for the One. Saruman said nay, that the One would never again be found in Middle-earth. It has rolled down the river to the sea, he said. Well, there let it lie until the end. Yes, yes, I was at fault and lulled by the words of Sir Ruman the Wise. We were all at fault, and but for your vigilance, the darkness maybe would already be upon us. But say on. Well, I and Aragorn here, we searched for Gollum, for hmm. my heart misgave me. Then I forsook the chase. And in Gondor, Boromir, I found a scroll that Isildur made, describing it after he cut it from Sauron's hand after the battle. Yes, he saw writing on it, which the heat made clear. He traced this writing, and when I read those words, my quest was ended. Upon that very ring, which you here have seen held aloft, round and unadorned, the letters that Isildur reported may still be read if one has the strength of will to set the golden thing in the fire a while. That I have done. And this I have read. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Let Legola speak. Alas, alas, the tidings that I was sent to bring must now be told. Only here have I learned how evil they may seem. Smeagol, who is now called Gollum, has escaped. Escaped? escaped. We shall rue it bitterly, I fear. How came this? We had not the heart to keep him ever in dungeons under the earth where he would fall back into his old black thoughts. You were once less tender to me when elves imprisoned dwarves. No, come, pray don't interrupt my good glowing. That was a regrettable misunderstanding, long set right. If all the grievances that stand between elves and dwarves are to be brought up here, we, we may as well abandon this council. Uh, I can see. Yes. We have failed to recapture Gorm. We came on his trail among those of many orcs, and it plunged deep into the forest, going south towards very evil places, and we do not go that way. Well, well, he's gone. He must do what he will. But uh, he may play a part yet that neither he nor Sauron has foreseen. And Saruman the Wise, what are his counsels to us in this need? Well, at the end of June, I was in the Shire. I then turned north and not far from Bree. I came upon Radagast the Brown, one of my own order, and I hadn't seen him for many a year. My news is evil, he said. The Nazgul, the Nine, are abroad again. Oh, no yes, way. they've crossed the river secretly. Who told you and sent you, I asked him. Sir Ruman the White, he replied. And he told me to say that if you feel the need, he will help. 
That mm. message brought me hope. And at long last, I came to Isengard. You've been listening to The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. R. Tolkien, adapted for radio by Bernard Mays, and featuring Tom Luce as Strider, James Arrington as Frodo, Lou Bliss as Sam, Pat Franklin as Merry, Mac McCadden as Pippin, Bob Lewis as Glorfindel, Bernard Mays as Gandalf, Ray Reinhardt as Bilbo, Carl Haig as Elrond, Eric Bowersfeld as Boromir, John Vickery as Legolas, and Gail Chug as Gimli and the narrator.